The XY Advisor podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. All discussion is limited to publicly available information and should not be interpreted as legal, professional or financial advice. XY Advisor does not hold an AFS license nor provide any financial services. Before making investment decisions, you should obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Hey team, Ben Nash here. I'm one of the co-founders at XY Advisor and founder of the rapidly growing Pivot Wealth, which is my business baby. I started from scratch about eight years ago and I've since scaled up to become one of Australia's better known financial advice companies for high income accumulators. You can join me every Tuesday as I have the pleasure of furthering my own knowledge by interviewing some of the best people in our industry and beyond to improve every part of what we do with our advice process. We're currently hiring financial advisors and associates, so if our approach resonates, you can learn more at pivotwealth.com.au forward slash careers. Perpetual is a dynamic, active manager offering an extensive range of specialist investment capabilities, including Australian and global equities, credit, fixed income, multi-asset, as well as environmental, social and governance, designed to help meet the needs of clients across Australia and New Zealand. Underpinned by our long-standing and market-leading Australian equities capability, Perpetual also offers an extensive contemporary range of funds. As one of Australia's longest-serving and most trusted investment managers, our long-standing commitment is to deliver superior outcomes over the long term to clients. Hey guys, Ben Nash from the XY Advisor team, and today I'm pumped to be here with Ash McAuliffe. Ash is the Head of Advice at Care Super uh, and comes from a big background through practice management, running advice team. So I'm keen to pick his brain. Hopefully he's got a few silver bullets for us uh, in terms of solutions there. Ash, thanks for joining us, buddy. Uh, thanks, Ben. Pleasure to be here. And thanks for the, uh, the the great intro. Mate, good to good to be chatting. And as I say, I'm 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 holding out for those silver bullets. So we'll we'll get there. But I thought maybe a good place to start was just Maybe you could talk us through your your background and how you've ended up in in where you are today. Yeah, fantastic. Um, I, I'm sort of I'm going to show my age here. Um, I started in my father's practice. Uh, he had an A and P practice. Um, 23 years ago, I started, so I was quite I was very very young. I, I, I'll have to say, but um, <laughs> yeah, so I, I'm, I'm so old that I was actually appointed as an agent and. Shortly after that, the uh, Financial uh, Reform Act came into play and then I was a proper authority holder. So, um, look, I, I, I was set for a career in, in science or uh, computer science. So I started a double degree in physics and computer science, but I realised I wasn't really good enough at programming to make a living and wasn't interested enough in physics to make a living. Um, and while I was doing that, I was, a, I was observing my dad who started his advice business as a second career. And... Um, he'd, he'd been with Telstra for a long time as a manager and what I noticed about my dad was his enjoyment of work and how he felt important in people's lives. He was having um, an impact on, on people's lives through helping them, you know, predominantly initially with, with insurance but then through their investment management going forward. Uh, and he had a real enthusiasm for, for his work which I didn't see when he was, he was working at, at Telstra. So. Um, I, I was away with the army at the time, and I, I thought, well, I'll, um, that's what I'll do. And so I came back and said, Dad, can I work with you? And, and, and here I am, uh, 20, 23 years later. So uh, that's how I got in into advice. Um, I spent uh, uh, seven or eight years working with Dad, and then um, he, he decided it was time to start uh, thinking about retiring. So I, I moved out into the big wide world and. Uh, worked with the Commonwealth Bank for a couple of years in the, in the business of private bank, uh, then followed with uh, with ANZ in the commercial bank, and 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 sort of with, with varied success. Um, sometimes very successful, sometimes the opposite of that. And the opportunity came up while well, I was at ANZ to purchase a a, a a book of clients, so I I leapt at that, and that was a great learning experience, owning my own practice, particularly. Um, taking over an advice relationship that you know, some of these clients had been clients of the, the previous owner for some 30, 40 years. So coming in a lot younger, 
uh, with a lot of trust built up over that period of time and, and having to take that baton forward uh, was that yeah, was quite yeah, quite a heavy baton to take. It's, it's re really important that um, you, you manage and keep that trust. After a little while, that, that sort of uh, ran its course. And um, I, after winding that up, I spent a bit of time at RMIT teaching in the Bachelor of Business Financial Planning major. That, I really, really enjoyed that. After a little while there, the, the call of the wild, uh, in a, well, it was a call from a recruiter, to be honest, but um, and, and the opportunity to, to come back into the advice profession uh, with Mercer came up as a team leader in the, the Victorian Strategic Advice Team. And over a couple of years um, working with Mercer, um, the, the, the role evolved to be the practice manager for Victoria. So there was, there was um, a team in Docklands and a team in Willis Hill. Um, and then I, I finished up at Mercer at the start of the year through redundancy. And, and as that happened, the opportunity um, here at Care Super came up. So I um, had a couple of months off and I really, I've I, I got to be honest, I really needed that reset. And bit of time with uh, with the, the kids and family and, and sort of ready to get cracking uh, and two weeks into my role here at Care Super. So that is 23 years in a very short time, man. Nice. I feel like we all needed a bit of a break after the uh, the chaos that has been the COVID, the pandemic and lockdowns and all of that sort of stuff. Tell us, Ash, yeah. what, what are you focused on? What What is the head of financial advice at Care Super? What comes across your desk? Uh, look, at, at the moment, there's um, you know, two weeks in. There's a lot. There's a couple of couple of little little projects that were sitting on my desk with bows on them. So I, I uh, you know, the the role had been vacant for a little while. So there's a couple of things waiting. One of those is is having a look at the different advice channels. The mandate I have is to to make advice more relevant to more people, and and that you know, essentially boils down to making advice scalable and affordable for for our members. Um, and the probably the most urgent priority, or the most the foremost priority, I should say, is, is digital advice and, and looking for a solution there. there. There's some work being done, and just working through that and what that means. And uh, you know, coming from an IFA background, it, it, it is um, something that I've, I've got a lot of interest in because it's an efficiency tool and it, it's a value add, but it's also got to be right. So um, mm. that's 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 the project that I'm working through most uh with most energy at the moment super interesting stuff and uh look i'm not expecting you to you know tell us all of your your trade secrets or anything here but uh, i think we hear a lot about digital advice and can see the potential to leverage technology more in the work mm. that that we're doing with clients i know that i've spoken to a few people that have tried it in different formats over the last little while mm. it is obviously a beast um in terms of the complexity and all of the different parts but for, for you guys like how do you actually tackle that? You obviously, like we we all know that affordability is an issue and and scalability. And I think it makes sense that we go, okay, well, how do we get it out to more people? Let's let's make it easier. Let's make it cheaper. But where to from there? How how do you actually sort of you know crack in? Yeah, I mean, there's there's technology providers out there, and and there's some good solutions. But ultimately, it, it's an automation, and and it needs an AI behind it, and like any automation, you're trying to take the repeatable parts of your role and, and sort of automate them so they can be more cost efficient and, and time efficient. Um, so so how we're looking at it is, is looking at the more simple parts of advice. So so if you think of the spectrum of advice that, that members seek, and, and that's, that's one of my learnings here at CARE, I've got to stop calling people clients, they're members, so there's a little bit of a, a language <laughs> difference but um, so so I'll use those two terms interchangeably from now on if that's all right um, but there's, there's times in people's lives where they need a little bit of advice and there's times when they need a lot and we just want to be able to be there for them when they need that little piece of advice and it, and so so we're starting with the very simple things uh, at the moment we're looking at yeah, a risk profile and investment change so can we take someone through an investment profile uh, conversation um, the challenge I, that, that I'm finding at the moment is that yes, we, we can we can automate a questionnaire, but as we know, the questionnaire isn't all of the conversation. There's a conversation with the mm. advisor afterwards. So, and there's an education piece before and after. So, how do we fold that education piece and information piece into the here? Do the answer these twelve questions or five questions or, or whichever survey you're doing. And then, and then make recommendations. So there's a lot of testing at the moment, and and that that's where we're at. And I think once we once that can be dialed in, 
then then that can be expanded on. So it, it'll be great when we can get it, you know, yeah. as a profession, get it right and be able to um, utilise those. And, and the, the term I like is, um, it's not, you know, it's not a robo advice solution, but it's a um, it, it augments our ability as advisors to, mm. to reach more people. So um, it's an augmented advice tool, not a standalone. Here yeah, you don't need an advisor. Here's a tool you can you can have you can get some information, get some advice based on 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 some rules, and and go forward from there. So I, I think it's really exciting, um, and there's there's a there's a focus here and, and an importance on getting this right and getting it out so that we can we can give advice to more people you know for the last 10 or 15 years in in my career we've been talking about the 80 percent of australians who don't get advice so that's, mm. that's you know, how do we how do we crack into that and that's looking at other ways to deliver advice absolutely yeah and i think over that time that we've been talking about this 80 percent, the cost of financial advice has doubled so it's like you know yeah, it, it gets a little bit more out of reach but yeah, as you say, it is quite complex. But I know that for us in in our business, that we work with a lot of thirty and forty year olds. Most of our clients are, um, yeah, thirty five to forty five. And for them, when they do a risk profiling questionnaire, most of them end up like balanced or or moderately conservative when they're just doing the questionnaire mm. on their own. Yeah. And then what what we do is to take them when we do our strategy sessions we take them on a journey and go okay well this is what this is what different assets actually are growth investments defensive investments this is small company risk versus big company risk diversification how we manage it active investments passive investments all of those things and then yeah in hearing that you know we and as we know as advisors that typically the your investment timeline should be one of the key drivers of the the actual risk profile for for your investment yeah. portfolio so someone's 35 for their super fund and wants to be moderately conservative you go well that seems a little bit out of whack with your timeline you know like after hearing this what do you think and they go oh yeah actually no i would now that i know how all of these risks are being managed then i'm comfortable with a with a higher growth portfolio because they they're actually informed but I don't know. Yeah, like I, um, yeah, I feel like if we just just in the questionnaire alone that they don't quite get there. So I know that the tech's getting better. Yeah. I would love to be able to pull on that to to like you say augment what we're doing so that we don't have to be the ones having that conversation necessarily because it is fairly repeatable or highly repeatable. Um, but yeah, yeah. It, it's uh, it's a tricky one. So I'm I'm interested in in that space. Well, if, yeah, and, and so I agree with you because if you went a hundred percent scientific on it. You would you would base it purely on the time horizon, you know, whether it's a superannuation that's 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 finite, whether it's a shorter term investment if you if you're looking for short term goal, yeah, the, the science and the math says you will most likely be better off with this type of portfolio, but then you've got to fold in those human elements. That, you know, we, we've got some volatile times at the moment, so so that will influence and and cast a shadow over how people feel about investing at the moment. So mm. that's where the, the human element comes in. So. Um, yeah, it, it, I think it's a challenge challenge for the profession, but I've, I think there's enough people investing time and effort and money into into some some good AI and digital solutions. So, um, mm. and so you obviously have had like got more exposure than most people, even though it is you know early days in, in your role there. But seeing what you've seen so far, where do you think we're going with when it comes to digital advice? I, I think it, it will need more of an AI engine behind it. I, I think it will be a tool to for advisors to extend their, their ability to advise rather than a replacement. You, you, you won't 100% use one of these tools instead of speaking to, to an advisor. So um, the, the smart businesses and advisors out there will, will, will be scanning the, the, the environment for what, what tools are available and as I said, use these tools to augment their ability to to um, to give advice. So let's take that conversation we just had, where you might have this ability for a, a customer or client to to complete a risk profile questionnaire, get some get some advice, but then also just come back to you with that information already. You know, half the conversation had, and you just need to top it off. So mm. um, that you you can you can get out to more people that way. So. Where, where we're heading is it will enhance our conversations and allow us to have more conversations rather than mm. replace conversations. And so how do you think that we'll get to a point where we can have a digital only solution for 
this or do you think there needs to be an advisor involved? Oh, I do think we'd get there. I'd, I'd, I'd be reluctant to say we would never get there. There's, there's, if I, if I can buy a car that can drive me home, um, surely I can, I can, <laughs> I can buy a program that can help me invest. So, uh, I, I'd, I'd be, I think I'd be short-sighted to say no, we'll never get there. But there's, there's um, a lot of work to be done in the meantime, and I'm, I think, think we're close. Nice. Well, I look forward to our next uh, podcast conversation and you can, you can give me the update on, on that one. Ash, I'm keen to shift gears a little bit and, and talk about yeah. sort of practice management and, and advice management overall. Obviously, like uh, we all know that, you know, part of the, part of how we make things more accessible is like you say, make it, make it efficient, make it um, cheaper as well. And I think that practice management can play a role in that with how we're doing what we're doing. What do you think are the real keys to success when it comes to actually running an advice team? Look, there's, there's a baseline or, or some hygiene factors are, are good systems. So that you, you don't have uh, you're not putting speed humps in front of your people, but what I've found the, is a team runs really well when the team themselves are coherent and they feel supported. They've got enough people in the team. They've got clarity in their role, and and they, they're operating as a team. So that that um, the the team being greater than the sum of its parts is probably where I've seen most value in in providing an efficient service. So when you've got everyone, uh, the analogy I used to use with my old team was the, the log. So if you're familiar with the Navy SEAL training where they've got to all carry that big heavy log and at different times people will be stronger or people will have, have weak days and they, they won't be able to take the full weight of the log but the rest of the team are there. But at some point everyone's going to take a little bit of the weight and share and, they, and, and the log gets where it's going to go. So um, I, I I've got a disclose right here. I'm very terrible at analogies. Um, but, <laughs> but, <laughs> that was a good one. I don't know what you're talking about. Um, yeah, but, but look, uh, and honestly, a, a well-functioning team because people are well-supported, they trust their leadership, uh, they, they, they want to come to work, they're happy to come to work. I, I find that is probably the most efficient um, thing you can do for a team is make sure that everyone's on board and everyone's happy to be at work. And so you know my next question already. How do we do that? Um, well, that's that. It's a long and slow, hard grind. It, it does start with trust in your leadership. Um, you you need to be a leader that you know, has shows some vulnerability. It's okay to to make mistakes as, as a leader and and own them, and demonstrate your accountability with those. And then that that gives people permission to put their hand up and say, "Hey, listen, I'm I'm struggling today. I need some help with this." Uh, and, and then that that sort of builds that trust. And accountability. Once you've got some accountability um, for the um, yeah, for, for the outcome, you, you you can sort of move ahead of the team. There's a, there's a book um, that I I you know if you're looking for a recommended reading, it's the Five Dysfunctions of a Team by Peter Lencioni. That was that was put to me uh, when I was at Mercer as hey have a read of this and being able to take that methodology on board really did help um, in in sort of establishing that that trust and and really focus some commitment um, from the whole team to the end goal. And, and I saw some fantastic things in that, in that team. Yeah, I think that that accountability to outcomes is the key part that people need mm -hmm. to know what those outcomes are, that they need to be measured um, consistently and, and you know, celebrated when they're good and addressed when they're, when they're not where we want them to be because yeah. everyone in teams have, they have a job to do a role and a role is tied to outcomes. So it's like we, we're hiring for, we love the people, but we're hiring for roles. And then um, it's that, that role needs to deliver certain results. But I think it, it's, it sort of ties in with practice management because I know for us that when the business was much smaller, um, like we were in the earlier days of the business before we had focused on this, that it was, we know what sort of like we want happy clients and um, to make some money. But like, yeah. then what are the things that need to happen in between? And it's every business is a bit different because you've got different groups of clients, different teams as well that 
um, you know, it, it takes a while to figure out what are those things, what do we measure along the way, and how do we actually do that in an efficient way so that we're not spending all of our time measuring everything as opposed to actually doing the doing as well. So oh, exactly, and and you know, what do you measure, and how do you measure it, and 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 how do you act, and how do you respond when the, it's not up to the standard? So you know, do you you've, you've got to respond constructively with okay mm. this this is where we fell short let's let's get together and see how we can fix that up and, and how do we fill that gap going forward and um rather than a you know the the, the yeah attack it with some compassion i think is is important as well so what what happened what you know what do you need for 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 us to move forward and, and not have that shortfall again Attack with compassion. I like that. That's. <laughs> I just, I just, I just made that up, Ben. So, uh, <laughs> but, but, but you do. You, you, you need to. And I've, used, I've used this term before. But as leaders, we're, we're custodians of people's livelihood, their, their careers. Mm -hmm. So, it, you, you need to be that person that helps them work forward in their career and get what they want out of their career, and, and that'll come back to you as, as, as an owner of a business or a leader of a team, whatever it is. But um, if, if you can, um, this is an old Zig Ziglarism. It's, you can get whatever you want as long as you help enough other people get what they want, and that that sort of yeah. resonates as in leadership as well. He, he was he delivered that as a sales context, but I'm thinking as a, as a leader, if I can help mm. my team grow and, and achieve what they need to achieve in their career, then that that will sort of work through as as um, and that'll come back to benefit me as a leader. So. Mm. Totally. What do you think? You've been involved a couple of decades in um, in advice and in sort of leadership roles within advice teams as well. What have been some of the biggest shifts in in you know how advice businesses work and how teams function that you've seen? What yeah, what I've seen is and and from you know when I started to to my time with the bank was very very numbers driven very you know what have you done today to move forward which, which is, is good but probably the biggest shift is towards uh, advice being more of a, as a social science than a an, an investment mathematical type mm. career so how we connect with our clients and members and customers, whichever one you want to call them, <laughs> um, how we connect with them on a personal level and allows us to to um, do a better job for them. So that's probably the biggest shift I've seen, where it is very much what conversations are we having, how 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 do we feel, how do our, how, how clients feel, um, rather than here's I know the answer, here it is, and I'll sell it to you for a price. Yeah, totally. And I think it's it's sort of like you were saying when it comes to risk profiling, like we know the scientific answer, but it's not always the same answer when you put the people overlay on things. Yeah. Um, on, the, on the flip side of that question, Ash, what are some of the things that haven't changed? Well, risk profiling hasn't changed. <laughs> uh, it's, still, it's, still, it's, still, it's still a questionnaire and, and we get a result. And, and I think broadly as a profession, we we recognize that that's not the not the right solution um that, that's, that is one thing that hasn't changed but um at the end of the day regard and, and probably coming back to um uh, that that time frame so I, I was appointed as an agent then we had uh, financial reform act and we had bofa and we've got the royal commission what hasn't changed in this profession is that by and large the the advice professionals want to get the best outcome for their clients and and the yeah, there, there's there's the, the one percenters that sort of ruin it for the rest of us, uh, but and, and there's the systems and processes behind it where the you know, motivations come from. That aside, by and large, what hasn't changed is that you know, people in this profession do want to get the best outcome for their their clients. So um, how how we, how we need to do that for, with a regulatory framework that that won't stop changing. I don't think um, the the only change I've, I've experienced has has been. Well, the only constant has been change. Yeah. So totally. Yeah, that, that's, yeah. that's something that hasn't changed. Ash, I know that you're uh, one of the things that you're really passionate about is is education. You know, obviously working you know in that space. Um, uh, and I think as advisors, we always work in this space all the time, and as leaders within teams as well, that we're constantly educating. Um, I, I'm sure that you probably know the stats. Um, better than I do when it comes to, you know, the, the gaps that we're facing around new entrants coming into the industry and advice. Can you um, give us a bit of your thoughts around where to from here? 
Yeah, look, there, there's um, a couple of things I've noticed, which which I, I went in to, to my role at, at, at the university with, with some preconceptions about what was happening and then uh, to find that there was a lot of students enrolling in, in sort of financial advice majors. So that was particularly at RMIT and, and, and a couple of other universities as well. Uh, but there were some large classes. Uh, there was you know, some classes at RMIT, the, the first year financial planning subject had 400 people in it. Right, but they, they were from other degrees as well. It was an elective. But I also noticed some people come across into that financial planning stream because they'd done that elective. So uh, in, in the final year subject that I taught, we had people who started a marketing degree or started an engineering degree. But then through that elective, they came across to advice because, you know, it's a great career. What, you know, why wouldn't you? The problem I think is, or not the problem, the, the, the blockage is we need somewhere for them to go. The graduates are coming through, and they're, they're uh, one, actually one. On, as a side note, one thing: uh, the, the the gender balance was there as well. So the, the the graduates were were a good good balance of gender. It wasn't skewed one way or the other. So that gives me hope for, for where we end up forward as far as gender balance is concerned. The the students quite often some of them, some of them my best students uh, yeah, they ended up at at places like KPMG or EY uh, because they had graduate programs. And that was a good place to go. And, and a lot of them had done double degrees in accounting as well as financial planning. Having said that, I've also, you know, I've followed some of the careers of some of my former students as well and, and yeah, very impressed. Obviously, they've had some good instruction through their, their studies. But um, seeing the people come through and they've had to fight through to find a role and find an, a, a, a company that will support them through. Um, so the next step is is us as a profession to make sure they've got a soft landing place so they can they can study through, and and know that there's going to be somewhere for them to to start work at the end of the day, and where there's there's practices screaming out for for talent, there's also I'm one of those ones. Up. Yes, yeah. and and yeah, but there's also. It's not very easy to bring on someone just out of university. You think that's a, that's a 21 year old who may or may not even have their own superannuation account, depending on, on whether they've worked mm. their, their career or not. Um, so we, we can't just, you know, we really can't do what, you know, happened in my generation was off you go, there's your, you're here, go, go give some advice. We need to develop more fully our, our, the entry to, to the profession. And that includes having roles that are, are an entry level graduate program. It gives the students a taste of the different parts of our, our, um, our profession and then guides them through that professional year. So I, I, I don't think there'll be too many students that will do their degree, go straight into a PY and then a year after that be giving advice. Um, you know, the exceptions obviously being career changes. So all people have been in, 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 uh, sort of financial services more generally and They've, they've, they've done their study and now they want to give advice. Whereas I, I think a better way is to put a, a graduate program in place that is specific to advice. Um, and, and look, I'd, I'd like to say that there's, there's a, um, a few of us working on that at the moment and, and not a, that's something that's important to me here at Care Super, but also to, to the rest of the professionals as well. So um, hopefully we can we can, we can grow our own talent and, and that does feed back to our conversation around what's important in a team is making sure that the people in your team have got some career progression. So having mm. you know, the, the people that are in entry level roles, they can see the next step and the next step being a, you know, an associate advisor with, with professional year um, you know, built into that role and then they can see themselves into a junior advisor then senior advisor and the way they go. So if they, if they can't see where they're going, it, it's going to be really hard to move forward yeah it's a tricky one because i think that not a lot of like businesses are built in different ways like different businesses are built in different ways and it's Mm. often the ones that are built for more entry-level roles that i've found that there's there's quite a lot of those that they want people to be more to not not like they hiring people for roles and there's stuff that they need to get done so they're less less of a focus on progression whereas for like for a business like us we want everyone to be progressing but we struggle more with the entry level roles because everyone's progressing so it's like we we're going to have to pour all of these resources into um, a new grad out of the industry and i recognize the pathway there that's how i learned myself um but mm. yeah it's, it's, i feel like we need to do something and i was mentioned offline that like 
the Horizons program, which I think was a fantastic um, yeah. program in terms of what it actually delivered through the structured training process. Some challenges, I think, for the people that were then sort of um, moved into the AMP advice ecosystem and a little bit, it was probably a little bit inconsistent from what I've heard, um, the the role versus the, the actual, you know, structured training. But I think that that sort of thing needs to exist because we've got, we're trying to get more people seeking advice and more people are seeking advice. Um, advice is yeah. getting better. Advice is getting more complicated. It's getting more expensive, more resource intensive that we need people, we need more people. And um, yeah. I was, I can't remember the stats off the top of my head. Maybe you know them, but some like pathetic number of new advisors registered over the last couple of years since all of this stuff came in. We've actually got three people in our business going through the PY, so I hope to do my little bit to um, to add to those numbers yep. over the next little while. But, yeah, it takes some time. And in the meantime, we've all got, you know, um, needs. Advis advisors are difficult to come by. I feel like we've been recruiting for an advisor role for a, a year um, in, in the business and the right people is challenging. So I do feel like we need to do something. Uh, just, yeah, it's, it, it seems yeah, like a complex piece to get there. It it is in 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 the absence and and look I'm, I'm you know I'm a fan of the Horizons program I've, I've hired people out of it um, and also I've seen the programs that the banks used to have but in the absence of of large organisations taking that that mantle I think there's an opportunity for a collective to get together and and and, and do the same thing what 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 do we what do we want this to look like and and move forward in that way so. You get a number of small practices that can get together and 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 sort of share that burden. Um, you know, yeah. we're, we're we're trying to we're trying to hire two planners in in our Sydney team as well, and that's that's sort of a, a challenge. We're, we're we are finding it challenging. We've got a couple of good candidates, and and um, hopefully we we can get them on board. But it, it is we're finding people. Oh, we, we accept another offer here, or or this that the other thing. So it is a, it is a very very competitive marketplace, um, but we can, if a number of small organisations, associations, whatever, can get together and put a collective together, um, then then I think we can solve that that mystery without relying on a large organisation. And and even even here, I don't I don't think you know a super fund like us, we're, we're not big enough to go. Okay, well, let's let's go and get ten grads. We we, yes. we need to sort of partner with other organisations to say yeah. we're probably going to need a grad every year, but. We need a bit more rigor and process around around the selection. Where do we find the grads? You know, do how many mm. how many um, businesses are out there introducing themselves to the universities? There's a couple of advisors that have been on this show before who who I've, I've met because they came to the university when I was working there. And the students absolutely mm. loved it. So, um, so yeah, I think there is an opportunity to to fill that void left by you know the, the horizons of the world with with a, a collective effort, um, and then there's a little bit more control over what, you know, what the uh, career aspirations are. Totally. And I think that the extra, like you say, that it's one, it's a tough market, but advice is such a personal thing that every business does it a little bit differently. So not only, it's not like you just need to find a financial advisor. It's like you need to find a financial advisor that fits that wants to do the work that fits in with your business, that wants to work with the clients that you want to work with, that wants to work in the way that your business wants to work as well. So it's like you've got a small pool, pool to begin with, but then you're, you need to, like to run a good business, you need to select and chunk that pool down even further. So yeah. I think the more yeah. diverse sort of approaches that we can get in, it means that we're going to have the right advisors for the right roles and that just, just benefits everyone and then the right that, clients that, as well. That is, yeah, you hit the nail on the head there. That that's critical. And being an advisor is too hard if you're not aligned with the direction of the business you're working for, or, or mm. you know, it, it's just too hard. You and as you know, you, you probably speak this more than I will. But as a business owner, if the people on your on your team aren't sort of really 100% committed to the direction you want to take your business, then then it's just going to create friction. So, totally. Yeah. yeah absolutely. Well, look, I could talk about uh, hiring and recruitment and the frustrations around that all day, but I, I'll uh, save everyone's ears. Um, Ash, thank you so much for <laughs> sharing all of your your insights. Uh, my last question for you, if you could go back to your uh, baby face self and starting out in advice and give them one piece of it, give yourself one piece of advice, what would it yep. be? I'll relax. Okay, relax and enjoy the ride. Um, I, as, as a young planner, I was really... Yeah, and, and, and I still, I still see it today, so, so it's probably pertinent. Is I really went hard on my technical skills 
which you, you need to. They're they're they're, they're a mm. foundation skill. Um, but relax and get to know the people you're talking to. And, and the piece of advice I would have given myself is, Ash, they don't need to know how the watch works. They just want to know the time. So, <laughs> so, so just you really said you weren't good at time. analogies. That's a great one. Oh, I stole that from my dad. So, uh, <laughs> but, <laughs> but no, that, that's just, yeah, re relax and, and enjoy the start of your career. Uh, I, you know, I, was, I was very... Um, ambitious wanted to move forward and and anxious to prove myself and and um where I, I, if I, I would love to go back and just do it all again but um i'll probably you know i'm happy with where i've ended up so yeah. nice one wise words there i think that the people side it's like you say the technical part is one part but probably the bigger part as you can see from your career and how that's progressed is the people element and, and all of the stuff that sits around it so yeah uh yeah, wise words there. Ash, thank you again so much for sharing your insights, mate. I'm, I'm super pumped to see where things go, especially uh, look forward to that digital advice update uh, moving forward, mate, and we'll catch you on the next one. It's fantastic. Thanks, Ben. Always a pleasure.